We talked yesterday about path effects at Palo Verde from distant sources to um, from the distant California sources coming into Arizona. And so in principle, we can be doing path effects everywhere, right? And that ought to be the approach that we're, we're moving towards in the future. We'd like to be able to make region-specific and heading to source-specific ground motion models if we can identify differences in the ground motion attenuation. Typically what we've done up to now is to say I don't have enough data, so I'm going to gather data from around the world. I'm going to assume that the, the path effects or the attenuation with distance is about the same around the world and apply them to my site. We have been now making changes in our GMPEs as we get bigger data sets so we can tell uh, the, the distance scaling in Japan is different from, from California, is different from China, and so forth. Well, you could take that further down in principle, okay, in the path effects in the same way. So what could we do at the Eibel Canyon to capture this? So we compiling a data set, looking at the ground motions in the Diablo Canyon region. So we've looked at earthquakes recorded within, uh, that occurred within 50 kilometers of Diablo Canyon, uh, recorded enough stations to allow estimation of the event terms. So we required them to be recorded at at least five broadband stations. Okay, here, and I put post 2007. This is the time when the installation of uh, PG&E was changing its, its uh, instrumentation from short period verticals just for locating earthquakes to broadband stations. So we needed to have that so the other ones really are, um, are not going to be useful for the ground motion side. They're good for, for the earthquake location. So we're starting there. So that limits the time to do this. Moving forward, as we collect more data, these approaches are going to be uh, um, more compelling and better constrained, I should say, but well, let's, let's move forward. So then we want to, once we have that, we compute the same way between event and within event residuals from that data set. This requires a GMPE that though works for that range of data. What I'm going to show you is we have, if we want to work with the available data now in this region, we need to go to smaller magnitudes, one and a half or even smaller, okay? I see already people shaking their heads, but um, if you tell me the, you know, the uh, wave propagation and impulse response of the crust is the impulse response of the crust, then I can get something out of these. Uh, the other part to remember, well, it, so we go, once we've got that, we have a GMPE, we can then compute our mean residual. At the station near Diable Canyon, there's a station, um, uh, DCD, right near the Iowa Canyon, like we were computing the mean residuals at the, the, the nine stations in Arizona. Here we're trying to use the, the one at Diablo Canyon because I don't want to, it doesn't help me to average the path effect over this whole 50 kilometer region because I'm trying to isolate things from the controlling sources at Diablo Canyon. So I'm going to get the mean residual. I'm then going to compute a site corrected within event residual at the Diablo Canyon station. Okay, so we call those the Delta WSs from Linda's presentation. You should all be familiar with this notation now. Okay, it's a little clunky notation, but at least we know what we're talking about when we try to use it, okay, or consistent. Then we're gonna take the, those residuals from the, the controlling sources and group them together, like we group the the residuals from the southern and the, and the um, um, northern sources in Arizona, and we're going to get that mean residual. So once I've taken out the delta W, the, the site term at Diable Canyon, that set of residuals is mean centered, right? It has a mean of zero, or I didn't take out the average site term. So that has to happen. Once I take that out now, I'm going to take it and say, can I see a difference between earthquakes offshore coming to Diablo Canyon or earthquakes onshore coming to Diablo Canyon? So I'm going to split it into the two pieces. And I want to be able to tell, can, do I have a path specific effect that I want to start to bring into the ground motion model? Okay, then we get this mean path term, p hat here, for each of the controlling sources identical to the, the process that Katie described yesterday. Okay, so we're good so far? No, yes? I got a thumbs up from Christine and, and Adrian, so that's good. 
All right. Um, so when we get these pass effects, one issue is going to be, but we're not trying to produce, you know, predict hazard from magnitude ones and twos. I want hazard from magnitudes sixes and sevens and eights. So what do these path effects from one little piece of the fault tell us about the path effect from the bigger events? Okay, so what the approach is I put here is using the path effect from the closest segment of a large rupture. Like we use the closest distance, we're gonna use the closest segment to define the path effect. And you can say, but why do you believe that? A big rupture is sampling lots of uh, distances and, and our ground motion is a combination of those. So there was an evaluation of this. Uh, Manuela Villani did this and, and presented it at the SCEC meeting last September, looking at cyber shake runs where we had magnitude sixes and up to, I guess, magnitude eights. And we looked at things that ruptured a single segment. Now for them, that might be five or 10 kilometer long piece of the fault and compared it to ruptures of hundreds of kilometers. And the ground motion was propagated through a 3D crust, so we had um, those effects in there of 3D crustal structure. This was only looking at three seconds where we were using the, uh, the CyberShake simulations. And we found that the path effect, that is the, 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 the rupture from a given source, let's say a big magnitude to my site, could be best predicted using the path effect from the closest segment from a smaller earthquake. So we would have multiple simulations, magnitude sixes, and we'd measure those path effects all along the bigger rupture. And the path effect from the closest point was the best predictor of the overall path effect from the larger event. Now that doesn't get you all the way down to ones, okay? But it gives me confidence to keep heading in that direction. We are now trying to bring in more empirical data to compare path effects we're gonna get from magnitude threes and fours to path effects from magnitude from, from bigger earthquakes. So you need to be looking at aftershocks from these uh, regions to check that. John. So in, in the simulation environment, the 3D simulation environment, would you see path effects. So in other words, if you had looked at another fault and the earthquake, the energy was coming from a completely different direction, okay. similar magnitude, focal mechanism, et cetera, would there actually be in the computed ground motions a difference in the path effects? Yeah. And if, if there not, isn't, then we're this gonna isn't take really all their funding away for three D modeling, okay? <laughs> so um, yeah, we see differences, clear differences. So um, I I hope you agree with me, Kim, that path effects should come out of your 3D simulations. So, um. I, I do agree that, that John, just one point of caution that uh, in CyberShake, uh, there's no nonlinear effects included. Yeah. So all the magnitude seven or eights are perfectly linear in, uh, in all its, its glorial, uh, glorious ground motion predictions. So there's uh, some, a lot of recent indications that uh, that's, that's not gonna be uh, very realistic, so. Right, but that would really go into our magnitude scaling, at least that's our, our concept. But I, I think you're right, we do need to be careful on, on, on how that's going on. But at, at least what we saw here is, if I, if I took a magnitude eight, so I've got a big long piece, and now I had magnitude sixes or smaller ones all distributed along that one as well, I can get the, the mean residual from each of those sub pieces and compare it to the mean residual from the suite of larger events that are run. And we find the best correlation is using the, the, that mean residual from the path effect or at the closest point. Okay, so it really is just saying the, the amplitude is, is most strongly affected by the, the, the closest rupture and that's not that big of a surprise. Okay, but we do have to go back and, and it, this hasn't demonstrated we can take magnitude ones and, and produce a path effect for a magnitude eight. Okay, but um, it, it's, it's our starting point here. Steve. Yeah, just, just another uh, note of caution. That's certainly not always true in, uh, in these 3D simulations. Uh, the, big, the great example is the, 
the Southern California waveguide effects have been discussed so much. You can put rupture uh, north of the, on the San Andreas north of the transverse range and you don't get much energy at long, at, at uh, three, four seconds period in LA Basin. You put it further away uh, uh, down uh, on the more southerly part of the fault and you pick up waveguide effects. So it's, it's not a universal so, fact. Yeah, so Steve, that wasn't quite clear, so I, I'm going to just repeat it just because for your, you need to really yell into that microphone. So what Steve is saying is if you're looking at that, that was called the waveguide or, um, in Southern California or, or you're getting a big amplification as waves come through, then that's going to, the source of the largest ground motion is going to control the path effect. And so if there was a closer piece, say more northern or the rupture was at a different place, that's, that closest point may not be controlling the path effect. And so I, I fully agree with that, um, but at least I don't have something that tells me it's, co it's completely the other way around, okay? Because we need something simple. Uh, we may find, so I'm talking to you about framework here. Really, you're going to see the amount of data we have available right now is quite limited for doing this, uh, but we want to, to move forward. And remember, lack of data does not mean certainty. Sounds easy, right? But if I don't have data to, to constrain my path effects, that doesn't mean there are no path effects. Right? And when we, so when we grab our global model and say that's what it is, if I ignore that, then I'm missing something. Okay, so our concept needs to be lack of information larger uncertainty and we need to broaden our uncertainty ranges. So part of this is going to be how will we bring, broaden our uncertainty ranges to pick up what could be the range of path effects in this area, okay? So earthquakes available. So I had um, Megan Stanton at pg e is working on our network for us and made these plots for me. So this is um, earthquakes uh, within 50 kilometers. I go a little bit further than that here. Um, that had at least five recordings at a broadband station and at least one within 50 kilometers. So I'm already being really generous in what I'm going to use. I need to take this data set to uh, be able to work with uh, getting a regional GMPE for this area. Because right? if I want to be able to distinguish path effects, differences here is Diablo Canyon is, is here. Osgri is off here. Earthquakes, ground motion is coming from this direction versus the Los Osos fault over here. Ground motion is coming back that way. Are they different or are they all the same? Are they following our worldwide average or are they different than the worldwide average? Okay. So here I've just plotted magnitude versus hypocentral depth to give you an idea. So there's uh, over a thousand earthquakes. Most of these are aftershocks from San Simeon. That was the big cluster up at the north. Okay, so that's created a huge amount of those. If I shorten the, uh, if I go a little bit closer, this is within 15 kilometers, but I'll show you actually uh, earthquakes out to 20 in terms of the, the numbers. Now it falls, we get a much smaller set to start to work with close into Diablo Canyon. These are the ones that we care about again, Hosgree over here. The shoreline fault is here. You don't see a lot of recordings yet. The data that we use to that, that um, Gene Hardebeck was evaluating uh, that led to the liniment of seismicity. Most of those were recorded on our short period verticals, not on, our, on, on the new broadband network, so I don't have all of those in here. These are just the ones we can use for actual ground motion estimation. Okay, so now I'm down to 98 earthquakes within 20 kilometers of Diablo Canyon. Okay, you can see the magnitude range here. All right, I'm down to magnitude zeros. I got a whole bunch around magnitude ones. So these are little earthquakes. If I'm working above magnitude two, I've got here maybe 10 events. If I'm working above magnitude one and a half, I might have say 30 events. When we come back in another 10 years, this is gonna be expanded greatly. Okay, but we need to have the framework set forward so we can move ourselves, we can learn something as time goes on and we can start to reduce our uncertainties. To reduce uncertainties as we gather more data, we need to establish broad enough uncertainties with no data to start with, okay? So if we say we don't have enough data to resolve the path effects, 
That's not the same thing as saying we are confident there are no path effects. All right? This is back to the issue of statistically significant and you don't add a parameter until you can say I really know it to saying what is the range of possible solutions that can fit the data. When I have very little data, my range of possible solutions is broader, not zero. Okay, and this has been an issue we've had in this business of treating lack of data, saying, well, then I'm just going to use my simplest model. That's fine, but you need to penalize yourself and broaden the uncertainty for lack of data. Not, I'm going to use my simplest model and declare it correct. Okay? So this is, a, this is a concept that we have to have in this business. Part of the reason for the last 30 years why our uncertainty grows and grows as we collect more studies is we started out using simple models and not penalizing ourselves for a broader uncertainty that's there. Okay? So, let's, so this is a small data set to work with, but we need to treat it. So our controlling sources, as you heard, you should know by now, Hosgri, Lososos, this is in order, those are the two main ones, then the shoreline fault, then the San Luis Bay. Okay, so for Hosgri, we're looking offshore sources, the nearest segment there, the RJB would be two to five kilometers away, depending on the dip, in the southwest direction. Lososos is going to be zero to seven kilometers RJB, uh, going into the northeast direction. The shoreline fault is a kilometer RJB to the southwest. San Luis Bay is more to the, to the southeast direction. Okay. So we're just going to now try to do two, okay, because our data sets really here. We have earthquakes around the Hosgree near this closest point that we think will be the most important for controlling the, the path effects if we are, are willing to extrapolate our, our evaluation of the CyberShake data. And then there's events on this side that are going to be sampling a similar path to what the Los Osos uh, ruptures would be. Okay? So what does that give me in terms of events to work with? So here are my 15 events. 15 is better than zero, right? It's more than zero, that's good. So, but I'm sitting here again back to small magnitudes and I may have here say 10 events over magnitude one and a half. Now we're getting to the same kinds of numbers that we had on the Arizona site. So, um, Jenny, do you remember how many earthquakes you guys had total? Or do you remember, Katie? 14. 14. So, we're not so bad. Those were bigger, right? Those were magnitude fours at least. But um, it, it's something to, to work with. It's not zero. Offshore, or going northeast then to the area over um, uh, uh, the Los Osos, a lot of these are aftershocks, but we've got 42. 42 sounds like a bigger number, but look at the magnitude range, okay? And if I'm above magnitude one and a half, I think I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven events to work with. Okay, so this is going to mean there's uncertainty there. And what do you do with uncertainty? If I had zero data, what am I going to do? I need to go around the world to see in areas where I had enough data to pick up path effects. What is the size of the path effect? How much could it be? What do we see? So we know what those kinds of numbers are. The standard deviation of the path effect in areas where we've done those studies is around 0.4 natural log units. So that's giving me a, an idea of what that number could be. Okay? If we start to go and bring these in, you would go to single path sigmas, right? You need to take it back out of the aleatory part if we bring it back into the epistemic part. So we can work through this and, and part of this to say, I've got path effects covered in my broader aleatory variability. So the phi SS term captures some of that term piece in there. Now we want to really see, is it truly random that I don't know or uh, completely unknown? Or can I tell whether these are indicating it's biased in one direction or the next other? Do these seven or 10 events tell me it tends to be positive or tends to be negative, I might skew my distribution of what the path effects is one way or the other. Okay. So we've started to go through this and, and I haven't got the ground motions process to where I'm ready to believe them yet. I'm confident enough to show them so we're just going to say what are we going to do from here. 
So we have to get our GMPE developed for smaller magnitudes than work in NGA West 2, down to at least magnitude one and a half. We can't simply plug magnitude one and a half into those models and expect them to work. There's a steepening of, of the magnitude scaling until you're basically proportional to moment at some point. Okay. Um, uh, Anne-Marie Balte and Tom Hanks have been working on this uh, now using the ANZA data projecting stuff down to magnitude ones and, th and there are ways that we can start to, to make those models work. The limitations we're going to have is small number of earthquakes per source region. Okay, numbers around 10. And the extrapolation of path effects from small magnitudes to large magnitudes. Those are two big extrapolations. What we want to see here, is there any, any indication that these path effects are positive or negative? Recognizing that right now in our using a FSS model, path effects averaged around the world, what the ranges of those are folded into our aleatory variability. Even though it's probably a fundamentally an epistemic term, it's folded in there right now, okay, into what's going on. So. That's where we are with this, and as we get through the processing of, of these data, we'll be able to see if we think we need to bias our model one way or the other for each of those two source zones. Adrian, are you raising your hand? Or? I may be jumping ahead, but here when you say lack of data does not imply uh, full knowledge. No data on path effects implies that we need to use, we cannot use single path sigma. That's my understanding. Am I, am I wrong? You're, you're correct. If you, so we could say, I mean, fundamentally, there should be a smaller aleatory term, and then we have the epistemic part, and we're going to combine those two. So yes, OK? So it doesn't, but we need to set up a framework that allows us to bring in data as it starts to come in. The other comment is on if we extend our GMPs to that, those low magnitudes, does it still make sense to work in response spectra? Because uh, the shape of the Fourier spectra, it's different when you go to those low magnitudes. So the mapping from Fourier to response spectra, will it, can, can, can we still work essentially in, in in spectral domain, or do we have to start looking at Fourier spectra? Life will be easier in the Fourier spectra, but in the frequencies that we're after, if we're above the noise level, you can do it. Okay, and that is if I'm if I'm on the response spectra uh, below at a, at a period longer than where the peak in the spectrum is then the scaling of the response spectrum Fourier spectra are similar. We get into all sorts of difficulties as we get on the uh, other side of that peak because then it, 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 it's sampling other frequencies, it's reaching back, and we're not sure what it is. But because these are all going to be small now and very high frequencies where they peak, I think it will scale properly. One question, Norm. Do you expect more scatter when you get to these very low magnitudes? Because for one thing, you are sampling, even, even if we forget our sources, you are sampling a very narrow part, I suppose, yes. because the source is very tiny. I expect more scattering, so, so less confidence that this is correct. So I, we're going to calculate this. We want to see wh where we are, even with the small amount of data. Some of this may come back to say, you don't have enough to constrain these path effects. Come back in five years. Okay, but we need a framework to allow ourselves to integrate data as it starts to become available. The other way we're going to be using this, just as an aside, is we are, have been using data recorded at Diablo Canyon from bigger earthquakes, San Simeon and Parkfield, and this lets us look at what those path effects are to see if those were uh, unusual path effects or if, if we had been mapping side effects into path effects. So that's going to be. Uh, a separate side result out of, of this. So it, it helps us there. But, but for this part, you're right, large uncertainties. If we look at our variabilities, we know a, a, the standard deviations got really big by magnitude three, right? And so that's going to mean my 10 
magnitude ones are probably not as, as informative as my 10 magnitude four to fives that they had in Arizona. Yeah, that, that, there's large uncertainties here, but we need to take on the uncertainties and say, what can we do with them? Just a quick observation, Norman. Looking at the earthquakes from the Los Osos side, it looked to me like the hypocentral depths scattered much more than they did from the Hosgri side. And that the variability from the shallowest to the deepest on the Los Osos side is a significant proportion of RJB. So I'm wondering if there's, you know, in looking at that data set, whether the actual depth of that earthquake coming so close to the plant might suggest a different path effect depending on depth. Yeah, so I used RJB, which you need to be careful because that's a horizontal measure only. So when the, these onshore events are at a zero RJB or right there, they're, they're then down at depth for low sosos because it's going to be dipping under the plant. So there's shallow depths closer to the, uh, in, our, in our source model, shallower depths where, where the Los Osos daylights and deeper depths at the, at the um, side, let's go back here. These would be shallower. These would be in principle deeper, coming deeper as again if we brought them that plane all the way under there. Okay. So <clears throat> Norm on just recently, last month, at the end of the month on February 27th, there was a magnitude 4 that was on the Hosgri right up near San Simeon. And, you know, it was recorded at the, at the five stations around the plant. And the variation in, in the uh, PGA is like a factor of 2, and, and, the, and the velocity is, I don't know, maybe even a factor of 4 in PGV. But did you, when you looked at that, does it give you any indication, first of all, about kappa? Any better sense of what kappa is going to be at the site? Or, and also, just what variability you would expect? Those stations at the plant are separated at most by a distance of eight kilometers. And to yeah. see that much variation, I wonder <coughs> what it says about the possibility of distinguishing path effects from, um, you know, on the, on you know, if there's that much variability. I don't know how the path effect is actually going to be Right, determined. so I'm going to be just using the path effects for this station that's closest. You're, you're talking about these other stations that are located here as well. So, exactly. Right. So we would, it, in concept, have a different path effect for this station and the one down at the bottom. We're just going to be using the one nearest Diable Canyon to th say that is measuring the propagation of the waves in that direction or in this direction. These, this is really the future of where this business is going. And we want to, what I want to do here is to not miss this or say it doesn't exist, especially as we're building, considering building path effects into our Arizona model. The same concept has to apply here. As Adrian said, you can just, as opposed to trying to estimate them and, and say that they're there, you can fold them into the standard deviation, which is what happens when we just grab the, the uh, single station sigma instead of the single path sigmas. Okay, so conceptually that's there. But it, it, we do, I think it's beneficial for us to set up a framework of how, as data come in, we can start to evaluate this. In two years, we might have twice as many data, or maybe we have to wait 10 years. But, but as that goes on, we can then start to estimate what are these path effects and get more refinement into the differences in our model as opposed to saying this is the same as every else, else in the world and I'm just going to throw it in as, a, as, as one site out of uh, all of the other rock sites around the world. As far as kappa from those, uh, you, you're right, you get different kappa values as we're going along here. Um, uh, the kappas that we have right now at Diable Canyon are about 0.04, okay? And that seems, that's a big number for uh, 1,100 meter per second velocity. You say, but how does that work? Um, the, the velocity structure right under the power plant is incredibly complex. We now have 3D tomographic models of the velocity structure in the top few hundred meters. And we can see what's going on. And so the next step is to 
is to model the effect of kappa by propagating waves into a 3D structure. But it, at, in this area in the top part, the, the beds are quite highly folded. They're not horizontal layers. Okay? Um, some are completely upturned and so forth. If you ever look at this from the shoreline, you'll see vertical beds or beds all bent over as this is stuff that was, has been uh, um, highly deformed when this area was a subduction zone. Um, so propagating the waves into that, we will be able to calculate analytically a kappa that we expect just from the scattering part. And that's what we're going to then compare as well to, to what our observations are. Uh, we do have at Diablo Canyon as well, um, in addition to this one, a bunch of little earthquakes um, that we didn't talk about here that happened to occur during our um, onshore seismic deployment, which we are running at a, a Nyquist of 1,000 hertz. So we can look at magnitude ones and see bandwidth up to 300 hertz in there. So now, compared to the problems we had in Arizona with the TA array, we have tremendous bandwidth to work with. You still have noise problems, but, it, but there's something to work with there. Okay. Any other questions on the concepts we're using, the approach to, to let's say, at least setting the framework for dealing with path effects in Diablo Canyon? No, everyone's getting tired, okay. Um, what I suggest we do right now, take your break. We need about 20 minutes to pull everything together. So I'm gonna give you a break till 3.30, 18 minutes. Then we will run through a summary and at that time also where are we going in terms of how we move forward with this. So our, um, I'll go over day one and day two as well, the highlights of, of what our items are that we need to address and then from today make sure we didn't miss anything and some of you are getting assignments from this to go check particular uh, or special items okay so 18 minutes back at 3 30.